Okay. Welcome. Java 17. Oh boy. Can almost drive a car. So let's start this. Will be a really long presentation, and I will try to squeeze it into 45 minutes. But uh, bear with me. It's a list of uh, new features that came in from Java 8 until Java 17. So all of them pretty much are towards uh, developers. So we'll see how Java has evolved over the years and um, how um, the platform has evolved over the years and how developers can actually use Java 17 uh, to code with you know, more fun. And uh, it's, uh, it's very nice to see the language evolve in, in this way, especially. OK, so my name is Simone. I work for a US company called uh, Webtide. We provide support and services for Jetty, which is a server container, a pretty well uh, known. And um, the thing that I would like to talk to you about is what happened uh, since Java 8 and Java 11, and then uh, guide you through Java 17. So let's do a quick poll here. Who's in Java 8 still? Raise hands. Well, not so many. Come, come on, in the back. Raise the hands. <laughs> so almost half of you. And uh, who's in Java 11? Uh, good, good percentage. Who's in Java more than 11? One, two, three, four, five-ish, 10. OK. So let's see. Uh, what happened in Java 11 since Java 8? Well, the first major features was introduced in Java 9. It was JPMS. Um, then we have um, nice uh, new collections additions, like list of, map of, and, and so on and so forth. We have var handles, uh, so now we can actually access fields uh, in, uh, using var handles to give them a very nice uh, semantic and performance. Um, Java Util Concurrent Flow has been introduced in the JDK. Uh, this is fundamentally just a copy of the Reactive Streams API. We will see that Java Util Concurrent Flow has now been actually used in the JDK. Uh, so Reactive Streams has actually went into the JDK because the new HTTP client shipped in Java 11 uses these APIs. So you can actually use this with other projects that use Reactive Streams like uh, RX Java or uh, Project Reactor. Um, we have multi-release jars. Uh, we have the interesting addition of var. Uh, it was uh, a feature that was uh, heavily requested, but then turned out to be, eh, OK, well, maybe it's not that useful, but OK. Um, and finally, we have container Docker awareness, because now uh, everything is inside the Docker container. Uh, then they don't work, but it's OK. Uh, well, we have, uh, we have them anyway. So uh, Java 11 was the first time that Oracle said, uh, oh, this is my long-term support release. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, we will see more uh, in detail uh, what this exactly means in Java 17. Um, but the key point is that I want to make is that when you move from Java 8 to Java 11, there is some work that you need to do. And uh, especially there are a few incompatibilities, especially regarding uh, some classes were removed from the JDK. We used to have those classes in the JDK since forever, fundamentally. Um, but now they got removed, and some runtime behavior changed. Uh, one of the things that uh, have been added, a couple of things have been added into Java 11, uh, in particular, two new garbage collectors. And um, these garbage collectors, uh, one is called Epsilon, and basically it's a garbage collector that does absolutely nothing. Um, so basically, it just builds the heap. When the heap is full, it just throws an auto-memory error. The reason for this garbage collector is that it is very useful to um, use it as a comparison with other garbage collectors. So fundamentally, it can allow people that is writing garbage collector to say, OK, how much is the overhead of my, of my new implementation? Let's compare it with Epsilon, and then we'll see what is my overhead. Okay? The other garbage collector that was uh, added in 11 is called ZGC. Uh, this is a game changer. Uh, in 11, it was still experimental. It has been uh, promoted to production ready in Java 15. We will see it. Um, but this is fundamentally the game changer. The reason it is a game changer is that it is a collector that is completely concurrent, apart 
very few small stop the world poses, but these uh, stop the world poses do not depend on the size of data, do not depend on the number of threads, do not depend on the live set that you have in your heap. Therefore, they are really, really small. Just to give you an idea, when um, ZGC was introduced in Java 11, the target stop the world pose for ZGC was set at 10 milliseconds, meaning we never want to pose more than 10 milliseconds when we do stop the world poses. Now, with Java 15 and then Java 17, this limit has been trimmed down to one millisecond, okay? So ZGC now is target is, I do not want to do poses longer, stop the word poses longer than one millisecond. This means fundamentally that whomever was tuning your garbage collector, uh, it, it's over. Uh, the, the garbage collection pose problem is practically solved. Uh, another change that was introduced in Java 11 was that the whole implementation of TLS was changed to support TLS 1.3. Um, this was good because TLS 1.3 was more secure and uh, you know the new version of the protocol, etc. So I'm talking about TLS SSL, um, X SSL. Now we don't use SSL anymore. But um, the key point is that it is slightly different from the previous one, especially a number of uh, ciphers were deprecated because they were found to be weak or even vulnerable. So they were removed from the Java virtual machine entirely. And uh, at that point, what does that mean? That if you have very old, uh, ancient code uh, that still runs on Java 1.4 that tries to connect to your server uh, and you switch to Java 11, well, then you may not be able to connect because uh, Java 11 says, hey, here's my ciphers. I have cipher. A, B, C, and then the client says, well, I don't know any of the ciphers because I'm still in the 90s, 1990s, and um, you know, I have no idea what you're talking about. So this is another thing, it's a runtime behavior change that you have to test for. Um, this is another interesting feature for those of you that work, for example, in education. You can actually now run the Java interpreter, Java, uh, without the need uh, of compiling source code. So you can actually run directly source code files. So you can do java, hello.java. What happens is that the runtime compile, it will be compiled on the fly, the bytecode will be stored in memory, load from the memory, and then executed. Uh, this is really useful because uh, you, know, you don't have to explain to your students, um, oh, you have to write the source code, put it into this directory, then you have to use Java C, but please specify all these parameters to Java C to put the class file into this other directory. Then you have to set the class path in order to this directory where you put the class file, and then finally you can run your, uh, your work, right? Uh, it becomes so much simpler. Just write the source code, Java, source code, done. Obviously, well, at this point, since you can write source code and then run it, well, that's not different from uh, scripting languages. Like, you do the same stuff with JavaScript, you can do the same stuff with Python and Ruby and whatever, right? So we can finally have proper JavaScript. Yeah. So the other addition was uh, HP Client. Um, nice uh, reactive APIs. We see here the style of this uh, HP Client is fundamentally using builders. So you use a builder to build an HP Client instance, you use a builder to build a request instance, and then you use the client to send the request. And um, for the body, uh, the request body and the response body can be read asynchronously in a reactive way using these APIs. There's a bunch of uh, utility method that makes this uh, really easy to do. And uh, so you can stream content as if it was reactive content. So it's a nice addition. Supports HTTP 1 and HTTP 2. Um, don't ask me about HTTP 3, although at the Jetty project we have implemented it, but it will be for another conference. So we move forward. Fundamentally, this, I mean, there's a lot more uh, that I'm skipping over uh, for basically any major release here. So I'm just going through the really uh, big changes. Um, but then fast forward uh, 2019, Java 12, uh, small release. The really interesting stuff is that there have been uh, upgrades and improvements to the garbage collectors. In particular, Shenandoah, which is a project from Red Hat, has been introduced in the source code tree of OpenJDK. 
Uh, that means, for example, that uh, uh, you can build OpenJDK and have this additional garbage collector within the binary that you have produced. But uh, the key point is that Oracle builds do not have it because it's a Red Hat project and why should I include something from Red Hat? So be aware that if you're using the Oracle JDK, you will not have the Shenandoah GC. When you try to start the JVM, it will say, I don't know this garbage collector, sorry, and I'm, and I'm just exits, okay? This garbage collector is uh, similar in objectives uh, to ZGC. The idea is let's not do almost anything in a stop the work pose. So we will do marking, we will do relocation, we will do everything concurrently if possible, okay? Poses are very, very tiny, again, on the scale of uh, ZGC. This is another solution for solving, once and for all, the garbage collection problem, pose problem. So if you need, so now you have two choices, not only one, uh, to solve your problem. Uh, sometimes uh, ZGC is a better choice, sometimes Shenandoah is a better choice. For example, Shenandoah is more suited for smaller heaps um, because it can work with uh, compressed pointers, and ZGC can't, uh, well, so far. And, uh, but yes, the idea is more choice, more solutions for a long-standing problem that was 20 years old. Java is slow in a way because it has garbage collection poses. Not true anymore. You have now two different solutions to solve this problem. Java 13, super small release. And in the meanwhile, so in Java 12 and 13, there were preview features that were added in, right? So I'm not talking about the preview features because they eventually became standard features, uh, but in later releases. So Java 13, super small release. Uh, well, super small for us, uh, developers, but in reality, they have completely re-implemented TCP. That was an outstanding work from the Java team because uh, in Jetty, we have a gazillion tests using the network and TCP, and we are really tough on those tests. We create a bunch of errors in order to test the most incredible TCP error conditions, not a single test failure. That was uh, an outstanding job from the JDK. Um, and, of course, more improvement to ZGC, why not make it even better? Java 14, 2020, we're coming close. And finally, we have the first feature that was introduced into the language. Uh, it was in previous uh, releases before, but now it's now officially in the language. Uh, this new feature is called Expression Switch. What's the difference? Well, you're all familiar with the expression, the switch statement. Okay, so it's a statement, it gets executed, but doesn't return any value. However, the expression switch returns a value. So you can actually write code like this one. You can do boolean workday equal switch, okay? Uh, which you couldn't do before. Before you had to declare a variable outside the switch, put the value inside the various cases, and then at the end of the switch statement, you could use the variable, right? This is so much more uh, concise and better to read, um, and now uh, the syntax is slightly different. Now you can use commas and not semicolons to um, uh, separate the various cases, and in order to produce a, uh, a value, you use the arrow, pretty much like you were doing with the lambdas, okay? And uh, what is the other interesting uh, part that this uh, new uh, syntax uh, change uh, brought in? It was that um, uh, the compiler, because you have to give a value to the variable, the compiler must enforce that all the cases are actually uh, covered, okay? With the switch statement, uh, for example, in the case of weekdays, you can just have something like case Monday, and then that's it. You don't have to put all the other cases. You don't have to put a default case at all. You just do switch Monday, do something, and then fall down, okay? With the switch expression, you cannot do that. You have to either have a default that gives a default value to, to the variable, or you have to cover all the cases, and if you cover all the cases, then you, can, um, uh, you don't need the default, okay? So what was a bug before now is a compiler failure. Your code does not compile. 
I have to say that I went through the Jerry code. I have uh, tried to uh, converse all the switch statements that we have to switch expressions, and it's really nice. It reads a lot better. It removes all the boilerplate code that we were used to read, but then our brain was kind of filtering out, right? Because it was like case, uh, value, colon, and then we add do something, then break, then maybe braces around. All that stuff goes away. The break goes away. You see there's no break here because with the arrow, we just return the value. So there's no point in having a break because, you know, you just return the value to the variable here. So um, what do you do if you have to do other things inside a case statement? For example, do a system println here. Uh, well, the way that has been determined, this has been under quite a bit of discussion while this uh, switch expression was in, still in preview, uh, was how do I return a value? Uh, because, uh, you know, it, it was decided that we have to use this new keyword, uh, yield, um, to return a value. Now, um, this is one thing that I'm, I'm going to say now, but um, these new keywords that have been added to the language, and we'll see many of them during this presentation, are not really keyword in the sense that, for example, you, you cannot use them as uh, variable names. Okay? They are special keywords. Uh, the Java team has been really careful at designing these new keywords in a way that they are context sensitive. So. If you use the keyword in the proper place, like in, in this case here, then it is interpreted as a keyword. Otherwise, you can still use you know, the same uh, yield word as a variable name or as a class name or whatever. Okay? So new keywords are now smart in a way. Um, all right, so this is the most voted feature for Java 14, helpful null pointer exceptions. What does that mean? It means that if you have an expression that is like this one, so c.b.a, when the null pointer exception is actually thrown, it tells you what was null. Okay, so in this case, you understand c could be null, b could be null, or the return value of a could be a boxed thing that you assign to a unbox, for example, a primitive integer. And then if the boxed value is null, then you get an implicit null pointer exception when you try to convert it to the primitive value. So now you get the precise uh, reason for the null pointer exception. Uh, a little tear here for the removal of CMS. It was a garbage collector, but it has since been replaced by G1. Um, and now it's been completely removed even from the source code. And it's now maintained separately from the OpenJDK tree. Java 15, uh, new features, text blocks. Now we can finally write multiple line strings uh, in, in, inside the language. Um, how is this useful? Well, um, what did you have to do before to write this JSON? Well, you had to do something like the line below, right? You had to do, you know, escape all the double quotes you have to you know, add the uh, carriage returns if you wanted them to be the JSON to be pretty. Uh, now you don't need any of that. You can just uh, write uh, the multi-line, the text block in this way. You use three double quotes at the beginning uh, that open the text blocks. Then inside the text block, you can put whatever strings you want. And then you use the terminator, which is again three double quotes. The terminator is important because it allows you to do margin management. So, for example, if you want to say, uh, well, I want to, you see here the terminator is only three spaces um, from uh, column zero. Uh, well, then that means that these three spaces should be ignored. Well, but then all the blue spaces that I have, they are meaningful. Okay? So that's important, for example, if you use uh, some kind of uh, um, configuration languages that are out there in the world for which a single space breaks everything or not. So this is what you get. Uh, and you have two special escaping uh, features. One is uh, to add a space, and the other one is to add and to remove the new line at the end of the thing. So for example, if you want to do the select statement, uh, then you need this space. 
And so you have to add the space, and then you have to remove the new line. And so the whole string be becomes a normal string, right? But you see here, there's no backslash, so this new line is preserved, and it's here, right? Well, since they have re-implemented TCP, why not? Let's re-implement UDP as well. Uh, this two uh, works uh, actually have been driven by Project Loom, which is yet another conference session. But um, if you're interested, you can ask me. Um, of course, uh, ZGC and Shenandoah are now production ready. What does that mean? Well, that means that they can run for hours uh, standard benchmarks and not crash. Okay? Is that a guarantee that in your particular case, the JVM will not crash? Well, no, but you don't have this guarantee with G1 either or with Parallel. You have a very good chance that it will never happen, but you know, you never know. Um, another small tier because they removed Nazorn. Nazorn was uh, the JavaScript engine within the JVM. It was of paramount importance when they had developed uh, Invoke Dynamic and Method Handles because this project proved that the idea behind Method Handles and Invoke Dynamic and the optimization that had been added to the JIT in order to support those two new features um, were heavily tested by Nazor. Nazor wor was creating gazillions of uh, method handles in order to support JavaScript. And, um, you know, so the project was really important. Unfortunately, it was deemed to be of too much cost to maintain it because you had to f fundamentally follow the specification of JavaScript or ECMAScript uh, through the various modification, and that was too much work. So removed. It's now an external project. You can still use it. You can still depend on it if you want. Um, but um, yeah, it's not anymore in the JVM. Okay. So for example, I had a project that was heavily relying on Nazorn. And uh, that project, fundamentally, um, could only be built up to Java 14, because Java 15 does not have Nazorn anymore. So what I've done is I have created a new major version of my project, which does not have Nazorn anymore, which can now be built with any subsequent JDK. Okay? But the old version uh, of my project stopped at Java 14. It's unfortunate, but you know, we need to move along. Finally, this year, Java 16, this is the most packed, um, new feature packed uh, version of Java uh, so far. And uh, one of the main features that was added was, uh, well, it's a small feature, but it's nice to read. Okay, It's pattern matching for instance solve. And uh, how does this work? Well, now you can have a variable binding after the instance solve expression. Okay, It saves you the cast. That's fundamentally it. Um, so what is it again? It is less boilerplate code that your eyes or your brain has to parse and then throw it away, right? Because you know that if you're doing object instance of my class, then what happens next is that you have to cast to my class, okay? So your brain was like, yeah, I know that I have to cast to my class. Let's just remove it from the brain parsing. Uh, I know that the variable is there. So. You know, this is fundamentally what your brain parsing was doing, but now it's in the language, so you don't have to do it. So it's good. It's uh, kind of smart because um, the scope of the variable that gets bound for the instance of expression is actually the proper scope. Uh, so for example, here, this expression has a negation in the front, so you cannot use the variable that inside the if, state, the if block. Okay, but you can use it outside, all right? And the same goes with um, uh, short circuiting expression like AND and OR. So if this condition is true, the first, uh, the left side of the AND, well, then you can use the S variable on the right side of the AND, uh, because, you know, this is, uh, uh, if it's not true, then it's short, so short circuited. So. Uh, the second part is not even evaluated if the first part is false. Um, of course, the opposite happens with the OR uh, statement, right? You cannot use S here because if the first one is false, well, then the variable is not bound. One of the main features that has been added to Java 16, finally, are records, okay? Uh, records are something that 
fundamentally all of us was actually already using. It's just that at this point, it has been said, OK, everybody's using it. There is a need for records anyway. So why not let put them into the language uh, um, as, they, as, as a primary feature? What they are fundamentally, they are named tuples. Okay, that's fundamentally what they are. Um, for the purest of object-oriented, this is like, oh, never do this, because these are called uh, the anemic objects, or you know, they just carry data. They don't have methods, really. Well, no, that's wrong. Don't do this object-oriented design. But, but, but the reality is, well, we need these guys. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, we have to use them from time to time, because, for example, we want to return uh, from a method call, we want to return two values. How do we do it? Well, the only way that we have to do it, we have to pack them into some class and then return that object. There's no way around it. So there is a need for that. Um, this is the whole definition of a record. It has this public record. So this, again, record is another of those context-sensitive keywords. So if you have named a variable in your code that is called record, it will still work. OK, because it's the name of a variable, and it's not the specifier for a class. All right? And uh, you, you give it the name, and then you have this uh, strange constructor-like syntax, but it's in the definition of the class, which is a bit weird, but it's actually nice to read. And then this open brace and close brace, it's not because I wanted to fit the record into the slide. It's, it, that's it. The <laughs> fact you don't have to do anything else, right? The compiler gives you uh, min ma uh, equals hash code to string uh, uh, the getters, the setters. So for example, you can use the max and min fields as they were fields, but also as methods. You can assign method reference to interfaces, functional interfaces. Um, they can be customized, like you could do with uh, enumerations, right? So you can have custom constructor. You can override uh, the standard methods, and so on and so forth. So here's a more detailed example. You can see, for example, that there is the definition up in the top. Then you can have this constructor, which is called the compact constructor, um, where you can do, for example, um, verification checks about the input data. Uh, you can have custom constructors. Uh, you can have static methods. You can have uh, cl normal class methods. For example, here you, get, you give the average between the min and the max. Um, and be careful not to override the standard methods uh, that expose the data. So what's the record all about, fundamentally? It is about a one-to-one -one relationship between data and the carrier, the wrapper of this data. Okay? And this is really important um, because they give, you know, they give more expressiveness to the concept that you're trying to capture in your code. So it's about developers and capturing things that make sense, right? If I return a pair int int, you have no idea what the ints mean. But if I return to you something that is called min max, well, then you can guess that it means that you get a minimum and a maximum. You know, the name of the record is expressive. So this is really good. Uh, they can be used for uh, as DTOs, but remember they are immutable, and therefore you can't. They can be used for uh, JPA entities because they are mutable, of course. And uh, you can use them as temporary tuples. So, for example, this is like a, a look at this. Um, this is a record, but inside a method. Okay. Did you know that you could do this for classes and, and other stuff, right? So it was already possible to declare a class that was record that was method local. Okay, now you can do it for record too. So for example, here I have a person with friend, and if I want to find the oldest friend of a list of persons, well then I have to carry over into the stream processing both the person and the friend, right? So what do I do? I flat map all the friends of all the people and I convert them into person with friends, this local thing, right? Uh, so I have one person and one friend as a record because I need to carry them both during the stream processing. Then I act on the friend and find the maximum, the one that has the uh, bigger age, 
and then I want to return the person with that friend. So I need to map back. Once I found the friend, I need to map it back to the person. Otherwise, I return null. Nobody uses uh, optionals, right? So with the occasion of creating um, record local, uh, method local records, uh, they have lifted a couple of um, uh, constraints that were there before. So for example, if you had an outer class and an inner class, you could not declare static stuff inside the inner class. And there was fundamentally no reason for that. So record came, this was lifted, thank you. It's not another nice new feature. You don't have to move your code in other places because, oh, you can't do it because it's static, cannot be inside an inner class. Eh. Um, better for developers. You don't think, you just write the stuff where it needs to be. So what is this one-to-one -one relationship between the class and the data give you? Okay, so let's look at this class, for example. Class percentile takes an histogram as uh, a um, parameter. And um, okay, so wh what do we know about this class? Can you tell, for example, because it's a percentile, can you tell what percentiles is this class returning? Well, not really, not really by looking just at this, right? You have to go and find all the methods. Maybe there are 25 methods in that class, and you have to really read the Javadocs of each class, etc. So it is carrying data, but you don't immediately know what it is. OK, how about this? Record percentile, int p50, int p90, p95, p99. Now, if I ask you, OK, so what is this record carrying? Well, now you know that this class does not expose p25, for example, or p100, right? You know that only those four are actually exposed as data. This allows, in a future Java version, to do stuff like this. You can do object, instance of percentile, and then you can say, OK, the compiler knows there are four fields in that record. So we can say, OK, we can explode the internal fields of that class and bind them to four different variables. Okay? This is possible because the compiler knows, well, this record has four fields. So if you put only try to explode this class into three fields, it doesn't work. Okay? Because it's a compiler error, because it has four fields, not three, okay? not five. Right? So it allows the compiler to actually do interesting stuff. And this goes with the, you know, again, using the code in a more natural way. Many languages like Scala or Kotlin already, had, already have this feature of being able to deconstruct objects and, um, you know, and be able to access the internals of those objects, recursively even. All right? And so you, can, you will be able to do this. Not yet in Java 16, nor even in Java 17 but eventually will come. Um, or this, this stuff here, you can do switch object, and then case percentile, and then again, the same explosion of uh, fields, and then do the same stuff, right? And this is again, notice this is a uh, switch expression statement, right? Uh, try to write this with um, not these features, and it's going to be you know, slightly more longer again. It's not a big deal. You can do it, but there's a lot of boilerplate code that you don't want to there. It's like, what, what for, right? So let's be streamlined and simple. Again, this is in a future Java version, not yet here. Uh, just to give you an idea what can be done, what these changes are, you know, are, they are working towards a uh, something. So, oh, sorry. So uh, this is a discussion about value types. So records and value types fundamentally are orthogonal. You can have a record, but you don't want it to be a value type. You can have a value type that looks like an integer, looks like a primitive type, but maybe you don't want that to be a record. Okay? Or there are cases where you want a record also to be a value type. So the two things are orthogonal. Uh, another addition to Java 16 are Unix domain sockets. Now, Unix domain sockets are available for basically every operating system. So um, you know, why not add them to the JVM officially? JPackage, another nice tool that has been added to Java 6, uh, 16. It allows you to create DEBs and RPMs and MSI exe for you know, installation things if you want to install and distribute your applications with this. Finally, Java 17, um, it's the new LTS release. What does that mean? Well, LTS, long-term support, is an Oracle marketing concept. 
does not apply to Java as the language or something like that. So it's not that it's more stable if it is 17 or 18 or 19. Um, doesn't matter. It's just the marketing from Oracle. However, what happens that when Oracle said, well, I'm going to support Java 11 or Java 17 for many years in the future, well, every vendor has aligned and says, OK, we also do that. And because every, every vendor did that, well, then every developer says, oh, yeah, yeah, well, Java 17 is more stable than 18. Is that true? Well, no. But uh, that's the way it is perceived. So it's a reality. OK, so let's go for that. The big change, however, is that Oracle also decided to change the cadence of the release train. So now, rather than every three years, uh, the uh, LTS release is two years, right? OK, so, well, th that changes a lot because, uh, you know, now you're becoming more and more obsolete if you don't keep the pace with the train. And uh, because, you know, even if Oracle says, oh, I'm going to do LTS release every two years, maybe another vendor says, no, no, I'm going to stay on three years. But the reality is that fundamentally Oracle is, um, you know, taking this, uh, uh, driving this. So it's, uh, it's important. Of course, they changed again the license. So if you're using the uh, Oracle JDK, you have to read the new license. OK, good luck. Uh, I typically suggest people to stick with open source vendors. Uh, one of them, which is really good, is Adoptium. Is, it is under the Eclipse Foundation umbrella. So the Eclipse Foundation has said, OK, we're going to create builds of the source code of OpenJDK. We're going to call them Temurin, which is a run, uh, an anagram of runtime. And then the project that manages all of that, so creating the builds, having the machines, so running the TCK, blah, 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 it's called Adoptium, all right? So these are released under the typical GPL and ClassPath exception. So it's open source, it's known. You don't have to particularly read the license, but you know, it's a known license. It's a little bit more familiar. Spring, that's the 500 kilos gorilla in the room. And they said, oh, OK, Spring 6 will be Java 17 as a minimum requirement. OK? Yeah, yeah, we're going to maintain Java Spring 5, but 6 is going to be minimum 17. OK? Why is that? Well, think of it. By the time the Spring guys have a very working uh, version of Spring 6, maybe, what, one year, one and a half years have passed? OK, so in a one and a half years, the new LTL release will be out, Java 21. So there was no point in having Spring 6 be based on Java 11 when by the time the Spring 6 was out, it was already based on a deprecated, non-maintained Java long-term support release. Okay? So these guys said, OK, we jump on the train, and we are on the train now. And then, you know, if you want to stick with Spring, well, then, you know, that's what you have to do. Either you stay back, and then you run after the train, or you jump on the train, and then you just sit down comfortably in your seat, and you go with it. JD12 will probably do the same, will probably require Java 17. Deprecation of Security Manager. It will be removed. Who's worried? For? OK, well, exactly. <laughs> That's why it will be removed. Um, yeah. OK, so the big news in um, uh, Java 17 is uh, uh, sealed interfaces. This is a, um, a design tool for developers, OK? Now you can say, I want my class hierarchy to be constrained, OK? So I'm saying that because this is a sealed interface, it can only have three implementation, not infinite like it can now, all right? So you can only have three implementations, OK? Start planet and satellite, OK, great. Uh, well, let's implement planet, and uh, it's a final class. It must be a final class, okay? Because it is one of the sealed implementation of the parent interface. However, what if I want to 
reopen the class hierarchy, well, no problem, I can do that. I can, for example, say non-sealed class star. I can reopen the class hierarchy because I have no idea how many different types of stars there are. And therefore, um, you know, I can, uh, I have to reopen the class hierarchy. Okay. This doesn't break the initial one because, you know, Celestial still has only three implementations, but star can have many more uh, subclasses. Okay. Infinite subclasses again. All right. Uh, well, then I can do Sealing again, well, and say, okay, satellite, uh, can, it's sealed again because it can only have two implementations, natural and artificial. That's it. All right? So class, final classes for both of them, and I'm done. Okay? This is nice. It's a nice tool for you to design things, and uh, it's good for developers. So typical implementation, uh, you know, case, shape, circle, rectangle, how do I implement get area? Right? Object-oriented way, abstract method in the base class, implemented in the two uh, concrete class, right? Other thing is that, well, now I can implement everything in the base class because I know that there are only two implementations. That's it. It's, you know, enforced by the compiler. So how about I use the switch expression to return a value immediately? Case circle, you see, it's a two-liner to implement this. Um, Give me one more minute, because it started late. Um, OK. Well, I can use records in conjunction with seal classes, because remember, records are final classes as well. So here's a typical implementation of an abstract syntax tree. right? I have a sealed interface for the main expression, but then I have permits add, const, and then multiply, division, subtraction, and so on and so forth. right? And this is how you do with the switch expression. You can do nice things. Um, okay, so conclusions. Java 17, lots of good stuff for developer. I didn't even talk about all the good stuff that it's in the runtime, uh, you know, a few performance benefits, the new garbage collectors. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I would like you to get this out of this presentation is Java 17 is a train. It's a train that is going even faster. Now, long term support releases will be out every two years, not three. All right. So, Major libraries, in particular the 500 kilos gorilla, is moving to Java 17. What? what are you staying back? Really? You know, I mean, you have to be really good at running if you want to stay back because you know the train is moving fast. So, what if you are doing uh, interviews for new developers? You know, a new developer come in and says, "Oh, yeah, yeah, you want to apply to work for our company? Great. Okay, so the guy asks you, okay, what Java version do you use?' And you say, "Ah, oh, no, we're still on Java 7." Really? I mean, this guy says, eh, you know what? <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to search for another job opportunity, you know, because, you know, what's the point? Um, before the session, uh, I was talking with friends, and they said, well, but why you just don't consider Java 17 as a patch upgrade of Java 8? You know, that's not difficult to do. Well, then you just uh, tell your friends, yeah, 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 we're using this new version of Java. It's a patch on Java 8. It's called 17. It's fine. And it works, right? So, so upgrade to Java 17. Um, you need to have a process to do that, and um, don't accumulate technical debt. And the train is going faster. So if you stay back, you're going to be obsolete, and you don't want to do that. You want to stay on the train and move forward. And remember, in two years' time, we will see each other again, and I will be here presenting Java 21, the new long-term support release, and I will be asking you the same question that I asked at the beginning, who is still on Java 8? And if I see half of the crowd still on Java 8, I'm going to kick you, okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>